comes up in question. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Ready to go back to uh, continuation of the budget hearings. Okay. Lights, please. So what I was thinking for tonight for the budget process was that we would review items for the discussion. That was the budget subcommittee's items that they have for discussion and then any other items that the city council members wanted to add, and then provide direction on a base budget for June 15th, 2000, um, provide a base budget tonight, direction tonight, and then provide direction on supplemental appropriations. So the thought process that I had was to allow council members to vote on a base budget, which did not include those items where there may not be consensus. And then what we could do is have supplemental appropriations, a resolution with supplemental appropriations prepared for June 18th, so that way the city council members could vote on individual appropriations that there was not 100% consensus on. So that's what I was, so that was tonight we would get directions to <coughs> that. What the base budget was, where that there was 100% consensus, and then those items that were not fully, were not full consensus, so that way I'd be able to prepare <coughs> an, or a resolution which just had the base budget for June 18th and then other resolutions for the supplemental appropriations as appropriate. So just to recap where we've been, there, the city manager proposed a budget for fis fiscal year 15-16. We looked at that base budget, that city manager proposed budget and what happened over the next five years if that was adopted today and with all the assumptions that we had talked about at the meeting on June 8th. As you see, we ha there's a deficit for this fiscal year of about one and a half million dollars. And in fiscal year 2018-2019, there it would turn into a surplus of about $350,000 and then a surplus in 2019-2020 of about $575,000. The re one of the reasons for the surplus in 2018-2019 as I had said on June 8th, June 8th, there, wa there will be some bonds that start getting paid off. And as you saw on the chart with all the debt service, as bonds get paid off, there is a reduction in the amount of debt service we need to pay year by year. The assumption, the, these revenue assumptions uh, and expenditure assumptions also included the known increases from PERS for the unfunded liabilities. It included re what I thought was reasonable and conservative estimates for revenues and reasonable and conservative estimates for expenditures. It assumed that everybody who is in the budget in 1516 stays through the budget in 1920, that there is a 3% inflation rate on our supplies and our service contracts. That seems reasonable given where we are today with all of our numbers. Um, it also shows that by 2019-2020 that the required reserve does come above, um, <coughs> is below the ending fund balance. So based on the reserve policy that you have developed, we would have enough reserve to cover that unfunded 
or to cover that ending fund, end, ending fund balance covers that required reserve by about five hundred, about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Stuart, before you go off to the next slide, can you just talk about that required reserve? Sure. That was established. Sure. The required reserve was established through the budget finance and budget subcommittee. There was a there's three elements to it. One is three and a half million dollars for a large emergency such as an earthquake or something else of that nature, a natural disaster. There is two and a half million dollars developed in there for um, a recession. What we did, what the budget subcommittee looked at for the recession was what, how much revenue we had lost during the recession from three or four of our key revenue sources, what we had lost over that period of time from what it would have been <coughs> if we had not had a recession. And that amount of money is about two and a half million dollars. And then there is a, an annual reserve for if the, any individual year budget doesn't quite meet expectations. And that would be 5% <coughs> of revenues and 5% of expenditures. And that's about, as you can see for this year, it's somewhere in that $1.5 million range. Okay. So when you add those up, you get to, for this year, based on this current budget, the required reserve would be about $7.6 million, so $7.65. And the ending fund balance is projected at $8.9 million. And that's assuming a beginning fund balance of 10.4. Okay, so then, you know, looking at the required reserve, on these numbers across here. So if we had another great recession, based upon the revenue sources that we have today, because what we had as our revenue sources during during the start and, and during the Great Recession are different today. Correct. Right? We we don't have VWR, we had VWR then, but now we have ecology. Correct. Um, so Based upon that, in these uh, required reserves, could we manage through a Great Recession? And what, you know, likelihood would be the, the, the ending fund balance, something like that? Um, if we had another large recession like we had in 2008, you know, you, you, we, would pro we would run through that full $2.5 million dollars over, you know, three or four this, years. This is set up to cover something like right. that. Right. So like a great recession, not just a minor recession, but a no, it, it's, it's, it, there's enough money, there's enough ending fund, there's enough reserve to do that. So if you figure you were going to have a recession starting in 2016, 2017, mm -hmm. your 2019, 2020 reserve would be about $5.8 million dollars instead of the 8.3 that you see there because we would take the two and a half mil we'd run through that two and a half million dollars and not to say that we would run through you know i think you know if we were to if we thought we were having another recession like we faced you know just a short period of go we would you know i think staff would make the same recommendations that we made at the time of the last recession which is we would relook at our positions i'm going to look to clay to make sure that i'm not misspeaking we'd relook at the positions that we had open we would determine if they were, you know, necessary for the community to have filled. You know, during the last recession, we held a number of positions open. We, um, you know, reoriented staff to different projects than we had. We would also look at, you know, all of our other expenditures. Instead of having, you know, looking at 3% increases, we would look to see where we could actually cut back on some of our expenditures. We would probably do the same thing that we had done in the last recession, which is hold off on some of our purchases, I think. Council Member Miller pointed out that the vehicle reserve fund may be one of those things that we might want to look at. We have enough cash to carry us through for a period of time. So in a recession, we may not want to put the full amount in the vehicle reserve fund that we're putting now. So that might be another. So we would probably manage through it. There's belt tightening. There's belt tightening know, that you we could sp still probably do. Yes. But, you know, we would anticipate, you know, running through $2.5 million of reserve, um, and we would be somewhere in the, you know, 5 and a half to $6 million range. Okay. So you're quite also. confident then that this required reserve that you are projecting w would cover um, – any recession, well, I'm just saying, but at least cover, you know, something that came during the last recession. Uh, you know, I, I am comfortable. I mean, I think, yeah. you know, there's a number of, you know, 
back in the last recession, we were running a little over $4 million in sales tax. So, you know, when we have a hit to sales tax during a recession, you know, that's a bigger hit to us than when we have a $3 million sales tax reven you know, revenue. Um, the difference is, you know, we do have $2 million right now, and the, this shows us going to the maximum allowed by the law for the recology or for the recycling business license tax. You know, the business recycling tax is based off of the ton, tons of recycling that they have in that area. It doesn't really get impacted by the recession as greatly as sales tax does. So, you know, we would anticipate that they would still stay above that number and we'd still be able to receive that full amount of revenue. So that's a different type of revenue than we had during the last recession. Um, you know, we would see property tax would probably once again go down. <coughs> We're back up to the $2 million range. We'd probably go back down, depending on housing values, <coughs> back down to the one8 one, you know, 1.7. So, you know, that would be 300,000 for a period of time. You'd lose some sales tax for a period of time. So the two and a half million is, I mean, that's what that two and a half million does cover. And we would look at it every year going forward because as we roll forward, the amount we need for that reserve goes up because as our revenues go up, we need to have more money in reserve to cover the next recession. That's right. And recessions only last for typically. <laughs> I mean, this last one was, was a long one, and then, of course, some people feel like the, the recession never ended. If you're without a job, I think you're still feeling as if you're in the recession. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, recession, yeah. Your income doesn't keep up with the, the cost of housing. Correct. I, you know, I think it's one of those things. Normally, you could start seeing a recovery within, you know, a couple of years in a recession. This one was a rather, you know, it was rather long. This was, took us about five years to really start seeing that recovery. You know, you go back to... Um, you know, I think when, you know, if you go back in history, you go back to the 29 depression, I don't know that people, as it started off, thought it was a depression. They were probably seeing it as another business cycle. And what happened was that the business cycle kind of, it recovered a little bit and then went back down, and that was a 10-year period. And, you know, before we really started seeing any real movement out of that one. You know, so we're looking at, cover, you know, trying to cover ourselves for about four years. And the challenge I think that we would face after that four-year period is, you know, how do we then prepare for the next one? And I think that's what staff would start looking at, you know, as soon as we had an indication that we were, we were heading towards a recession or in a recession, is how do we start preparing for that next recession? Mm -hmm. You know, we, for the last, for the 2008 recession, we started, you know, we started seeing signs of that early, you know, earlier than others. And we started making some of those uh, hiring f freezes early. Um, we went back to our employees and asked for zero pay raises earlier than some other cities did. I mean, all those kinds of things is what we would be trying to implement as soon as we possibly could. Because we, you know, it's one of those things, we might get out of the recession, you know, four years later and then, you know, get back into a mini recession two years after that or get into another prolonged recession. So the sooner we can recover the reserves, the better off we will be. And I think that's one of the things that we have to keep in mind is, you know, just because we have the reserves set to continue our operations um, and our services to the public the best we can doesn't mean that we as a um, staff aren't looking to say how do we tighten the belt to figure out, you know, how to, you know, save for the next issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's good. If I could piggyback on that, Stuart, to the comment on uh, going to the employees, uh, we, we had a recessionary clause in the contract, and no other city had that. I mean, it, so it, that it was an unusual one, and you know, cities keep asking, "How do you get? You know, how do you put that in, and what does it mean when you're in a recession?" Mm -hmm. Okay, and you know, and we've had that clause in the contract, I think, since 2001, that I know. <laughs> And in the 2005 recession, you know, we looked at whether, or 2003 recession, we looked at whether or not we needed to implement the clause. And based on the revenues that we had at that time, we did not. And I think, you know, those times that, you know, it, you know, when the econ when the overall economy doesn't affect our city as greatly as it affects others, you know, we may want to look at that to build additional um, trust with our employees. You know, one of the reasons that they were that they were able to, we were able to work so well with them in a in a contract that was still ongoing, 
was because they had trust that the council and management was working together to try and find the best solution and we were not only looking at balancing a budget off of the employees um, compensation I and mean, that's always a challenge you know because as you start doing that you start creating where people say you know I don't know what's going to be here what's going you know what's going to be here tomorrow so therefore they may start looking at other jobs and I think what we were very fortunate of through the last recession is we were able to maintain our workforce uh, not only you know the physicians but also a lot of the people <coughs> And as you know, as as you maintain people and as you keep your staff intact, you know their ability to do the job improves over time, and their knowledge of the community improves. So therefore, they were able to take on additional tasks <coughs> that you may not find if you had to hire a new person into positions. Mm -hmm. So I think you know as we're working through, you know, whatever, whenever that next recession is, to really think about how do we want to manage through the recession. Um, so as a recap, um, and this one shows a slightly different number for what the net impact on the fund balance what is, is I have 1.4 million. The difference of that hundred thousand dollars is, you know, one of the things that was on the uh, budget subcommittees list was delaying and hiring of you know th new positions, Bec and the ra the rationale was is that so much that we were going to delay recruitment, but by the time we were able to hire them there was going to be a savings that number was a hundred thousand dollars we reckon you know I think um, as staff we recognize that's going to happen so I we have moved that from the budget subcommittees recommendation into the base budget so there's a reduction in expenditures from what you saw last time of a hundred thousand dollars and because of that there's a reduction in the net impact of <coughs> balance um, so we're you know we're, we're looking at about 1.4 million dollars based on those delays in the hiring Um, then um, Council Member Conway asked me a question, uh, you know, trying to give an idea of, you know, what what may what do those other items that we put into the budget make up of that 1.4 million? So the non-reoccurring expenditures were about 639 thousand um, dollars, reduction in future costs. So this is the new unfunded liability expenditures page that I had shown. So the idea behind that number is if you it's either a pay me now or a pay me later type of a question so if we start putting money aside today to pay for unfunded liabilities in the future then you know we have you know then we're going to reduce the cost that we're going to need to pay in the future when those unfund when those liabilities come due so it would be similar to paying off your mortgage the more you can put aside towards your mortgage today the sooner you'll pay it off and the less you'll have to pay because you're saving on your interest costs and all those other things. So there's $274,000 um, in, uh, in reduction in future costs through the new unfunded liability expenditures. There was new regulatory costs that we had of 296000 So, you know, with those three items, you know, if you take those into account, then the impact to fund balance based on the above items would be in, uh, still having a deficit of about 200000 not to say those are not real costs to us. Not to say, you know, not to say that, you know, the reduction in future costs is not an ongoing cost. Not to say that the new regulatory costs are not ongoing costs and we need to account for. And those are accounted for in the five-year projection. But I think Council Member Conway's question to me at the time was, you know, all those numbers were there, but, you know, what do they look on one ch like on one chart? Combined, yeah. And that's what I was trying to answer on this one. Um, the budget subcommittee had a number of proposed recommendations for reductions. The volunteer projects to the city council budget was $10,000. Southeast Crocker Precise Planning and Community Development, which is in the community development budget, was $200,000. Fiber optic consultant um, in public works is $25,000. Public arts implementation guidelines and parks and recreation was $20,000. You had $25,000 in the area. And in the budget it was twenty. dollars So I think I mistyped it here and I typed it right on one-time expenditures page. I think I had those two without without different with two different numbers, so it was twenty thousand in the budget. Um, chairs at the community center and parks and recreation for nine thousand. I'm sorry, are you talking about page forty two? Um, page forty two was the one where it was the one was the budget the budget subcommittee's proposed reductions. That was twenty five thousand in there. But if you looked on the page, and I don't know off the top of my head where it was showed one time expenditures, I think it showed as twenty thousand. 
And, and I apologize, that was a typo on my part. And if you look at the budget page itself, <coughs> in so the- 20,000 is the correct number. 20,000 is the correct number that's in the budget. That's on page 29. Yeah, and that's the correct number that's in the budget. And I checked that when I saw that the two numbers were different. Mm -hmm. um, chairs mm -hmm. at the Community Center and Parks and Recreation was 9,000. And as what I had said at the time when we went over this, the budget subcommittee talked about taking chairs from the Mission Blue and moving them down to the community center to try to extend their life because they're not going to be as they're not as heavily used down at at the community center. They are not, you know, it's not we don't rent them out at the community, you know, rent them out in the same way at the community center, and you know they're stored differently at the community center. So for all those reasons, that nine thousand dollars seemed like a reasonable um, reduction from the budget and subcommittee. Uh, lane lines for the pool and parks and recreation at two thousand uh, dollars. Painting the office at pools, which is in parks and recreation, again at seventy eight hundred dollars, and the increase in the day in the park funding, uh, which is in parks and recreation, it's ten thousand. It's not to say we're not going to do a day in the park. It's not going to say that the day in the park is going mm -hmm. to be any less than it was last year. It just means that we would not have increased rides. We would not have increased opportunities for people to. You know, to partake in. So what it may mean is we they may we may need to shift some of the attractions we had last year to different attractions just to try and give it a new fresh look this year. But we just wouldn't add to that budget, and that was so that totals two hundred eighty-three thousand eight hundred dollars. And then also, the there was additional items that the subcommittee thought should have further discussion: the public facilities condition assessment. Um, for fifty thousand dollars and the bike trail pedestrian master plan for fifty thousand dollars i think both of those there has been discussion at the council level in the past about maybe doing those in different ways than just hiring a straight consultant for that amount of money right up front i think that was the rationale why the budget subcommittee thought that those two would be good to have further discussion on just to make sure that everybody is in alignment with where we're going and then the uh, project that they thought might you know, um, in the capital projects that should be for further discussion was the Alvarado to Tulare Stairway, Phase A, which is the Alvarado to Santa Clara piece. 100000 of that would come from the utility fund, and 125000 of that would come from the general fund. Um, if that was to be included in the budget, that, of course, would be in addition <clears throat> to the budget because that was uh, one of the unfunded CIPs. And just to recap where we were on the CIPs, there was two projects that were included in the CIP. One of them was the money from the special revenues for the street project that we do every year, and the other was the money for the um, skateboard park, 50000 from the general fund, and then I believe, I don't have my notes in front of me, but I think it was 196000 from the business license, capital projects, um, and then 5000 from grants, I think was the way that added up. But I don't have the precise numbers in front of me, so I might be a little bit off on those numbers. Um, and then all the other projects, the, I, the budget subcommittee said what would be better is if those were put into a priority order and then <laughs> reviewed again in February, or perhaps not even putting them in a priority order, but recognizing that they'd be reviewed again in February when a better understanding of how, you know, how the 2015-2016 budget was, <coughs> was happening, and then also as we had a sure number as to what the 2014-2015 ending fund balance was. We won't know that precisely until sometime in October when all of the, when the auditor comes in and they do any budget adjustments for themselves, you know, that they see that we need to do, or um, journal entries. Um, so what I have done is I have a spreadsheet with all the items that from the budget subcommittee on it for discussion. Um, so that way there's a running total on it, and I, I'll put that up, and maybe that might help you know, work, walk through the conversation. Um, so that way I can have a, keep a running track as to where we are in the deficit, because I know one of the areas expressed by the sub budget subcommittee was that the million and a half was a very large in, uh, decrease in, in reserves in this year, and that you know, maybe a smaller number would be better this year, and looking at you know, doing maybe some of those projects in future years. So I do have that available. I will do that. And I also, not only do I have the um, project and the dollar amount and then a running tab as to where we are in the deficit, but I also have each of the council members' names and columns so that way we can track 
where they are so that way when I get to the supplemental appropriations, I can do that as efficiently as I, as I can. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Laura, you said you had some questions for staff. Uh, yes, thank you. So um, on page 38 of the uh, PowerPoint that you gave, um, talks about capital projects, and I noted that one of the projects that is unfunded was the city entryway project, which Correct. was funded previously. Um, and I understand that currently it's been, we talked about it at the council, and we asked that it go towards or to different um, committees and commissions. So if it's unfunded, um, would that work still be able to be done? And is the intent that it would, in a future year, be funded? What was the thinking behind that item? Um, you know, it's one of those things that if there is no expenditures to bring it to the commissions to talk about how we would like that designed, what are the elements that you would want in it, that can be done, you know, even without funding. If you're looking to hire a, um, a landscape architect or some type of design person, then that would need to be funded in this year's budget if you'd like to get that done this year. Um, I think what the subcommittee said was that um, that it's not that we wouldn't want to see if what we can do is just waiting, you know, the one and a half million dollars is a large uh, deficit and that we would want to make sure you see where we are standing in this year's budget and then the unfunded, you know, where we are in the reserves. Um, okay. So at this point in time, it's not an anticipated expenditure in next year's budget. Okay, which means that if there's no expenses, it, if there's no consultants hired, it could still go through the... If the media's in commission, correct. If there's no, if there's no um, hard, what I would say is a hard cost to the city. If right. it's staff time, you know, then we can continue to work on that. So if you're saying you'd like the Parks and Recreation Commission to look at what kinds of elements they would like in this in the gateway, you know, that could be done through the Parks and Recreation facility, you know, facility subcommittee, mm -hmm. and they can work through that process either with the Public Works Director or with myself who's the staff person for that, and then we can bring back those kinds, you know, you already have a preliminary type of design that you were, that was brought forward to the council. We can look at that and say, here's suggestions to that. Okay. And if you want to do that with the um, Open Space and Ecology Committee, mm -hmm. that can be done through that process, through them as well. And then the Complete Streets can look at it if that's another committee you'd like to have look at it. Okay. So all that work can be done. It's just that we would not be hiring somebody to you know, to do the design, and we would not be hiring somebody to construct right until it's funded. Okay, and then where in the budget um, can you remind me about the library? Where, if anything, um, funding for that was? There, there is no. So the city council at their meeting uh, for the design process um, had agreed had agreed, and that would be in this that would be out of fourteen fifteen for the money needed to develop the design process. Because what, what the public works director talked about was, you know, providing funding for designers to develop um, an image or something that they could, and, you know, Randy could talk better about it than I can, that we would provide funding for them to do that. So that would be coming out of 14-15 numbers. So that would not be in the 15-16 budget. Okay. And we're, we were not anticipating having that process finished until some time later in the year. We don't know what the next dollar amount that we would need at that point, so it would be better to do that through a supplemental appropriation at the time that we have more information as to what the next step in the process and what the cost of that is. Okay. Thank you. And under capital projects, again, there's um, three items that the Parks and Rec Commission recommended funding, but they, um, city staff um, through the budget and the budget subcommittee um, said that those would not be funded, the Lippman Field bathroom, the Quarry Road lighting, and the dog park lighting. Can you talk about um, how that came to be? Sure. I mean, uh, again, it's, you know, the question, <clears throat> excuse me, it's the question of, you know, how much do you want to use reserves in the 15, 16 year to pay for, you know, pay for things this year, or do you want to wait to have a better understanding of where you ended up in 1415 and have a better understanding of where you're going to be in 1516. You know, I always bring back a um, mid-year update 
um, sometime in February, March, depending on when that can actually when that gets takes place. I provide city council information concerning the budget process, you know, where we are in the budget throughout the year as best I can, given time rest constraints. Um, but we have a better understanding in January where we are because we are, we will have received our first property tax payment. We will have received unfortunately only our first sales tax payment for the year but we get an indication from that we get an indication through six months of room tax so we get a better understanding of where we're going to end up in 15 16 so the i think the idea between you know with staff and with the budget subcommittee was be before we commit to spending money you know a large amount of money on capital projects that were not previously brought to the city council that we would wait to see where we are and you know look at it again in February. Um, none of those are time sensitive per se. That we're not you know trying to beat the clock on any of those items. Okay. And I think there's also probably a lot of discussion that's still. I mean, you heard last week from one from a citizen is that you know there's probably still some discussion on some of those items that need to be had. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Ray. Yeah, I, I just wanted to. Um, uh, reiterate actually some of the things that thank you Stuart you already said <laughs> in terms of, uh, thinking of, uh, of the subcommittee uh, but when we uh, the first uh, budget uh, draft budget that we were given had a uh, one million seven hundred thousand plus deficit in it and that kind of uh, shook us up a little and the reason being is that generally speaking um, when times are good and uh, revenue is about as good as you can expect it to be. Uh, those are the times when you try to have virtually no deficit. In fact, it's even better to have some surplus so you can build up your reserves to deal with the inevitable recessions that will be coming. And so we felt that um, there was a kind of a disconnect in our sort of approach to, to budgeting, uh, that we were out of cyclical sync. Uh, and so we start working with uh, with Stuart and Clay and saying, you know, okay, so what can we do to to deal with this uh, really significant uh, deficit, which we don't really think we should have at this time? It's not that we are against a lot of the things that are in the budget or that are listed but are not there. It's just that um, we want to try to reduce the budget to the minimum that we can and think about prioritizing the timing of these other things so that we don't really get ourselves behind the eight ball in terms of losing our reserve capacity to deal with you know, real recessionary situations. Because uh, if you look at the page in here in reference to you know, what are the, the real reserves, of course that is the cash available. Uh, and that's actually, uh, if you take out what, we're, what, what has been proposed in the uh, original budget, uh, we're down to, you know, 6,800,000. And we're supposed to have, uh, you know, 7 million uh, over, was it 7,600,000, uh, you know, just to meet the basic policy. Uh, and in terms of the cash available, we would actually be below that. And, you know, 1.2 million of what's in the so-called reserves is an account receivable, which we won't be getting for many years, if ever. So there's a kind of a false sense of security there as to how big our, our real reserves are. So our thinking was, let's see what we can do that's responsible to reduce the deficit as much as we can. And so we've done a number of things in, in cooperation, uh, you know, with the staff and. And like, for instance, we came up to the realization that, as Stuart mentioned, that um, some of the new positions that we're talking about hiring for, you know, they're not going to be in place for, for months. And so we don't really need to budget for paying them <laughs> when they're not hired yet. Uh, and there are other things that probably we can uh, wait until, uh, as Stuart was saying, until we really get the mid-year review, which tells us what our actual situation is for this fiscal year. So we know, uh, you know, what the actual, you know, situation that we're dealing with, because now we're, we're based on, on estimates, not on, on actual facts. So we were trying to, to be responsible, fiscally responsible, if you will, 
to say, look, um, we really shouldn't have this much of a deficit in, a, in good times. Uh, and we need to see if we can find ways to, to put off things uh, or to delay things uh, so that we know for sure that we're in an affordable place. And so that was kind of our thinking. Uh, and I, I don't think there's anything in here that we are you know, opposed to. It's just a question of, of how do we get the deficit, projected deficit, into a reasonable number. That's really what we've been trying to do. And then everything else, you know, we're happy to uh, discuss, but uh, it really has to do with our sense of what things can be delayed for six months or a year, uh, to, you know, to see what the actual facts are on the ground. <clears throat> I, I agree with, with that. We, we both were sort of stunned by the, the number, and I know that you know, we both have a lot of confidence in Stewart's projections and, you know, his confidence in, in where the trends are going. As a council, we did make that decision to um, fund the vehicle replacement um, fund and start those things going <coughs> so that we, you know, build a reserve that's for specific known needs. And I think that's a good thing to to start with, um, but we're not we're not caught up yet. We've got a lot of years of catching up to do before that's funded. And for me personally, um, looking at page thirty seven um, of the slideshow with the um, outstand outstanding unfunded liabilities, those aren't even really looking at what is in our payments. These are things that are still out there and we don't have a real funding source for those. And you know, that's $17 million. That's a lot of money that we're still not looking at. And you know, to, to, to have those without having a substantial reserve, I think is, is, you know, not being fiscally prudent to be spending more than we should now when we have so many of these liabilities that are out there. So uh, that's why I know all these things are things that people want and in a perfect world, sure, let's do it, let's build it, let's make it better, let's fix the roadways, let's fix everything and make everything better. But I don't think that we can do that all in, in one year, you know, or over several years. I think we need to take a real slower look at it. And on specific projects, if we say, you know, this is our highest priority or our second highest priority, and you, you start the planning process and you get everybody's hopes up, and then there's no money to do it, it's really hard to go backwards and say, Sure, we've designed whatever, and, but we're not going to build it because we don't have the money. It's really hard to go back because the expectations of the public are there that, well, we've been working on designing a project. We've been committed. We've been asking for it. We've been involved, and now you're not going to fund it. And then where's the expectation of, of why did they waste committee's time or their time to work on something that we may not be funding? So while it's okay to look ahead at projects you may want to do, I think we all need to have a, a reality check on whether we have the money or the capability of staff to take care of certain things in this budget year. I, I'm just kind of curious what what project do you think that we would reach out to the community and get their involvement in design that we then might not be able to fund? Well, a past one, which we have funded now in this budget, was the skate park. And you don't think we that we fund it? We, but we are funding it. That is funded in this budget, yes. Yes. 
but having gone through the process, all, all the people, a lot of the people involved in that process really felt that because we had designed it and talked about it and done the happy flow chart of how things would happen, that it was a done deal. And had there been a re that we couldn't have, we're taking money out of general fund and we're taking money from other sources to build that. And that's a priority that this council made. Yes. And voted for. But to stop that process once you've done the design and you've got those people involved is damn near impossible because the ball's rolling and people don't expect the ball to stop. So when you look at other projects of, you know, let's design the entryway. If you get OSEC and Park and Rec and everyone looking at designing the entryway and spending the time and being invested and then saying, oh, well, we're not going to build it because we didn't fund it. It's really hard to stop at that point. So uh, it's just a, a concern of mine of, of saying these are projects we want to do in the future and getting people's hopes up and hopefully you can build those projects in the future but I think it's it's something you need to sort of take your time and really know where you are budgetarily and to not be paying down our CalPERS debt and our pension debt and in a more aggressive fashion I think is putting the debt load later down the road Uh, you know, one of the things that you brought up, Ray, was the, the cash reserves. And uh, so, Stuart, I have a question for you. Um, so during the Great Recession, these um, <clears throat> reserves that are paper reserves, uh, the ones that we have today were the same ones that we had back during the recession. We don't have new paper Reserves. I don't. They're think the they, same. I, don't, I think they are the right. same. Right. And so yeah. we dealt with the recession, having that those types of reserves that we counted as reserves. Correct. Okay. All right. I just just wanted to have clarification on that. <clears throat> All right. Um, you know the 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 debt that we have. I mean that's 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 our responsibility. We we decided that. Uh, you know, because we income is 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 uh, greater, that it's time that we take care of some capital improvements, right? That we, you know, things that we put off, we're going to invest, and and also uh, hiring staff to to take care of the services that maybe um, we're we're a little on the thin side. I mean, that that's that to me. That's that's what you do when you. When you have the money, you, you make investments, and so that, that's why I, that's where I see that that um, you know the direction that we've been going. Of course, you know there's there comes a, a certain point where you can only do so much, and I think that, that that's where you're getting at. Mm -hmm. And you see that big number, and you go, okay, wait a minute, maybe we need to uh, you know prioritize the things that we're investing. And I think ultimately, in the end, that's what it comes down to: is okay, how, how do you prioritize? And so I don't see it as, like, you can't fund these things. It's about what do you want to, how do you prioritize the things that you do want to fund? And because there's a, a lot of things in here that, you know, others could say, well, why are you funding this? Why are you funding that? And the things that aren't on your list that are in this budget are things that you, as a committee, subcommittee, are priorities, priorities for you. They're important to you. And these other things that are on your list are not, don't reach that level of priority or prioritization that you feel should be funded. Well, let me, uh, let me. I, I, I'm just, just trying to understand. Bit. I'm just let trying me to just understand the methodology. a little bit because right. quite a bit of this came from staff and wasn't directed from the subcommittee. Staff came with an initial proposal. And most of the staff budgets were in the proposal. A lot of the mini CIP projects were in the proposal. Um, and 
out of the list of items is where we looked at things and said, asked questions, some got it left in, some got where we think they need to be discussed. But the ones that were listed here as unfunded were unfunded in staff's proposal because our finance director did not feel comfortable putting them in as funded that he didn't want to go in debt that much. That was, yeah, that's staff's recommendation. And that's you guys staff's recommendation. Yes. And from there, we tried to, you know, we sort of came up with an, a number in theory that we'd be comfortable with. And what was that number? I was comfortable under a million dollars. Was the general throw it out there, where do you want me to be? And staff couldn't quite get to there. And we couldn't quite get to there, to in agreement. So this wasn't that we went through and, you know, asked everyone for a 10% reduction or, you know, went down to the minute details as a group. We took some of the bigger numbers that we could affect and looked at what what we could do to try to make a difference on a budget that we felt was fiscally appropriate. So th this, uh, well, before the uh, the hundred thousand in delayed uh, hiring, it was at three eighty eight eight hundred. So this is this is the compromise that both of you came up with. These were items that we could agree on to compromise. And we felt that um, the other three items had either um, <clears throat> staff concerns or council concerns that we'd heard before about whether to include them or be able to handle them in a different way or postpone them. So we had come up with an agreement, basically, that that we felt that the 388, which really is the um, 288 now, or 283, I guess, yes. um, with, the, with the addition error differences, um, that we could come up and say, yeah, we can agree on those changes. And that the other three items warranted, rather than for us to try to duke it out in our meeting, <laughs> to bring it to the full council because we knew there were some opinions on those items that that we couldn't agree on. So that's why we listed it as such that um, there are items that, and I, I won't say which one's which, but you know ones that we disagreed on whether it should be there or not. Mm. Well, not to belabor it, <clears throat> let's get to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I'm I'm fine with that, and I like uh, the method that Stewart has proposed for dealing with it. But I just wanted to let you know kind of where we were coming from. Uh, we're not really opposed to these things. It's just a question of the deficit is just too big, and maybe we can postpone some of these things. That's kind of where we're coming from. I get it. So, uh, if if I may ask, um, so the the I'll just go right to this big one here, the two hundred thousand dollar Southeast Crocker Precise Plan um, Community Development. So, um, how do you? I mean, we have um, we have an obligation to rezone by January thirty first. So that that might be hard to postpone. Um, you know, I mean, I feel confident with the council that we have, you know, to to work with the community to come up with the the plan that we that we'd want to have. Um, but we know that to, to have that robust community engagement is going to cost money. Granted, we might be able to work with the the county and do you know do a healthy community 
workshop and, and perhaps get, get feedback that way. But, um, you know, we also know through Redwood City, when they did their precise plan, one of the things that they forgot to do was a community benefit zone. Right? So you, you rezone and have this greater value, but then you don't get any community benefit from it. But how do you analyze you know, what that amount is? Right? So there's that economic analysis that we would need in order to do that community benefit zoning. Um, you know, in order to get funding, from other agencies, you have to have a smart plan. Yeah, if you want to get money from MTC, if you want to get money from ABAG, um, there's uh, some money from some other sources to help with the planning process. I mean, I see this $200,000, if it's earmarked for, you know, coming out of the budget, but I could see us reducing that amount, right? We might budget it, but that doesn't mean we're going to spend it. And that doesn't mean that we can't get other money from other sources, like I just mentioned, to reduce that. Um, you know, and the other thing is, you know, so in our housing element, we've identified some, some properties that I don't feel we are really confident that they should be housing. But we put them in the housing element so that then we could have greater flexibility <coughs> in our planning <coughs> and but in order to take advantage of that planning uh, advantage we have to have a, an extremely robust plan you know when you have a precise plan and you put form based codes in that plan what you're saying is that we as a city are going to determine what those what that development is going to look like by not having a precise plan, and you just zone it, what you're doing is you're taking the um, control and you're putting it into the hands of the developer. And that is the last thing I think us as a council would want to do. $200,000, which I do not feel is something that is, uh, you know, is going to break the bank, but I don't think we're going to spend that money anyways because I think we'll get money from other sources. But I think it's an extremely wise investment to engage our community to say this is how this um, housing development is going to look like. And so, um, again, you know, I think that we should put this money or that we should keep this money in the budget as staff has recommended. But I, I think we should recommend it as a council that that money should be in there for that, that process. So um, could I give a response or? Sure, I just want to echo what, what Cliff said. I mean, we're both on the economic development subcommittee, yeah. so you know, we're um, okay. in favor of this. We've discussed it at the subcommittee, and you know, I, I agree that by, you know, we're going to have to zone it according to the housing element laws. And if we don't do the specific plan, it just, it's too, I think it's a very dangerous situation because once you zone it, then a developer can come along and do what they want. And by doing a precise plan, then we get that community input and we gain more control. And, um, and also by looking at the entrance to our town, not just what was in the housing element, but the shopping center and the property next door, then that's really an opportunity to design the entrance to our town. Um, and to retain that control and make sure that it's going to be what reflects Bris Brisbane and you know and not be cookie cutter which I've you know I've heard those concerns during the housing element discussion um, and in looking at what Redwood City did you know with their precise plan it's you know it's about taking architectural elements and you know, putting in putting place in putting in place rules about how you want it to look and I think that would be a very wise decision, and also, you know, to have the opportunity to create some some workforce and affordable housing, um, which is obviously the goal of the housing element. Um, so I also am. I, I think that I'm very much in favor of, of spending that money this year, and I think, given the housing element requirements of zoning within a year, 
Um, that's not something that we can put off. I think that has to be done this year. That would be it, one of my top priorities. If I may, or sure, yeah. if you'd like to go I'd first. I'd like to respond. Um, and um, the first off, I mean, all the things you say, I mean, sound very nice and so forth, and I have you know, no objection to that. Uh, I'm concerned about timing and and uh, staff load and planning commission load and. Um, my argument would be that um, we got the Planning Commission and the staff dealing with the Baylands, FEIR, and planning, which is a huge, humongous task, and they're probably going to have to have multiple meetings uh, in the fall. The zoning for the housing element is due January 31st of 2016. I mean, I don't see any way in the world you're going to do all the stuff that you're talking about for another year or two. Uh, as long as we are totally consumed by the Baylands process. I mean, it, to me, the expectation that we can do all the wonderful things that you're talking about, while at the same time we're dealing with the Baylands and the Recology Project, it's just totally out of the realm of reality. We need to hire another whole set of staff. I mean, it just isn't feasible to me. And, and so my view would be that, that what we need to do is, you know, just do the zoning that's already clear in the housing element and get through the basic uh, initial baylands, which is going to consume all of us for, you know, a year or two. Uh, and my guess is, it's just my guess, I could be wrong, nothing's really going to happen out there in the, uh, where the zoning will be put in place. And then you could do all this, uh, you know, wonderful uh, planning that you're talking about because, you know, we don't really have a proposal there. This is something we have to generate ourselves and we have to pay for it ourselves. There's no developer to pay for it. In the meantime, we're trying to put the baylands together. It, to me, it's, it's just not a realistic expectation that we can do all these things simultaneously. That, that, that's my concern. So during our economic development subcommittee meeting uh, a week or so ago, we asked John, well, what, what would it cost then if we just had staff handle this internally and just do the zoning? And what he said was that you could, you know, maybe cut it down to $100,000 of cost and, and it would be a really steep learning curve for staff to handle all of this internally. So, and that, that we have to do because of the housing element. So I, you know, I hear what you're saying, but I, I, I don't think that I think this community is capable of, of working on, on both projects. Uh, you know, I, I think there's a, a large number of very engaged citizens, and yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't yeah, want the public. I, I, I have my it. view, and and I think I'm I'm pretty confident in it that, uh, and and I'm almost positive if you go ahead and do this, I'm going to be in a position of saying I told you so. <laughs> uh, I just think you're trying to bite off too much at one time. That, that's kind of my big concern. You know, and that's, that's why there's money in the budget to, <clears throat> excuse me, to hire the consultants, right? So that it isn't all about staff doing the work. Um, but there, there is the risk. If, if you zone a property for a much greater value than what currently exists, and a property owner says, you know what, eh, I'll just wait. I'll wait until the, the council decides to change the zoning, maybe later on down the line. Maybe it might be better than what they're offering me right now. That's a risk you take, right? And so I, I'd rather have the city be the driver. And the reason why we decided to not put the, the village and the 125 Valley properties in the housing element so that we could have control. So we weren't going to be handcuffed by the state regulations of the housing element, right, of the housing allotment. Okay, would it take a lot of community input, like where then the community would not uh, uh, be interested in the, the, the Baylands? I, I, I agree with Lori. I, I mean, I think our, our community is very capable of spending some time on this. And, and when you look at the Baylands, I mean, that's, that's a development that might happen 10, 15, 20 years from now. But when we look at what's going on today, 
you know, what's happening right now? If we rezoned and created a, a precise plan that said this is how it's going to be, so that a developer could come along and say, okay, if I design my project based upon your criteria, then I know I have an opportunity to get a project done, and we have an opportunity for a project to happen. And so with this type of market, you could see something happening you know, in the next five to seven years. With the bank, bank lines, you, you're not, you're, you know, who knows? And it could be a testing of a, a model for this sustainability framework. Absolutely. So, so I know some of you were here when they tried when they designed the community park and what what was City Hall going to look like and you know all these different things and I don't think anything has gone through in six months where you could get our community to agree on what the downtown is going to look like. I'm not even sure you could get the community to agree on what color to paint the shopping center in six months if you gave everyone their due and gave them, you know, what do you want to see the vision for the future and get people to agree. Um, we made a decision to, to, to do our housing element and using the properties that we used. And now we want to bite off a much bigger chunk and rezone the lot of it. Uh, no, that's not the case. If we rezoned the, the village in 125 Valley using those numbers, we probably would not need the Park Lane property. Well, then why did we Again, make we that? Again, we did it so we could have flexibility. Well, then we weren't really truthful that so many we had this discussion that this was the best decision where, where everybody thought the housing was best there. And now we're going to say, oh, well, we really didn't mean that. You know, we've talked about it multiple times in mm -hmm. dealing with this. And we wanted to have the greatest flexibility for us to design and to plan for what we want the entryway of our city to be. Okay. Clark? Got me straddling a fence here and a certain part of my anatomy is aching. Um, <laughs> I, I want to ask staff questions, but you know what? Um, can we move on from this and go to something simpler and come back to this? <laughs> well, this is, the, this is half the money. Uh, okay. John, you're the appropriate person to ask on this. What? I'm hearing both sides of the argument, and, and both sides are good arguments. So, uh, what, what's your take on this? I want to hear. No, I think there are a couple, a couple pieces. The way the housing element was designed, you could extract out the two zoning districts that are created mm. meet the housing element obligations without looking at the broader sort of entry in the shopping center and whatnot so i mean that's feasible um it's nothing that staff could do i think that with our current staffing levels in-house so that would require some resources um to do that and i think we talked about that hundred thousand perhaps is a number to get the appropriate level of community input um, but there are a couple things that does. One is, um, you know, the idea of are there, it does then lock in, when, once you design a zoning district, particularly on Park Place across from us, it really does sort of limit your options on looking at the 125 Valley site uh, shopping center, sort of remodel, redesign. Um, you, you're no longer going to take a holistic look at that. You're going to look at two strips of residential and mixed-use zoning, and that's going to be the, the scope. So, you know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think that's a policy decision for you. You know, on the one hand, it makes it easier for the community. It's less to chew on. But on the other hand, it is limiting, I think, the city's broader ability to plan that area holistically. So, you know, that's something you have to weigh. 
Um, in terms of the zoning sort of districts, you know, staff stands behind the location of the zoning pattern that we established in the housing element. There was a discussion about, especially I think the the park uh, park place mixed use. You know, and is could that be in a better format relative to 125 Valley or faced onto the shop onto the Valley or um, Old County? Maybe you know, that, I think those are the areas that you would have a little more design flexibility to look at. It may not be a straight set of buildings marching down park. It might be something that was bleeding over onto uh, 125. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of design options that would be precluded by doing this, um, you know, moving forward with just the zoning for the housing uh, element. Uh, the other issue is funding. You know, I think we, we've we identified a couple. Well, one funding option uh, for a grant that we would be pursuing if the, if the county does or the city does authorize this um, planning program and activity for the larger precise plan area probably doesn't make a good candidate for that particular grant program if we limit it to those two residential districts. So mm -hmm. again, we probably would not pursue, I, I don't think we'd pursue the time and effort for that grant with a, a more limited um, planning program or effort. So I understand the complexity and the difficulty and I certainly council member Miller's sort of point is well taken about the amount of sort of time and energy in the community's engagement in these kind of things is, is a commitment on everyone's part and you know we have to move forward with the housing element zoning one way or the other and if the commission's you know, they're going to have to make time for it, frankly, to get this moving along in a, an appropriate and legally required manner. Um, you know, again, uh, is is it really in the best interest of the city at this point to take the larger precise plan area? Um, you know, I think the Economic Development Committee, there's certain potential spin-off benefits that might come from a reinvigorated shopping center and reconfiguring of the gateway. Those are all issues that would be in play with the larger precise plan that, that you know, would be off the table if we limit it just to housing at this point. So I don't know if that helps, but that's Could you kind of step me through what you think if uh, if a 200 was was approved, what the logistics would be? Because if we're looking, you know, the uh, target date's January 31st, 2016, to have the housing element Peace. done. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a really heavy lift, and it's very aggressive. Um, and frankly, if I go to the state on January and we're in the middle of a hearing process, I don't, I don't think there's going to be a huge harm done if we're not, you know, signed, sealed, and delivered by that date. But we sure have to be have showed significant progress. You know, I can't be in a position, you know, with reporting out a next housing element and say, well, we're starting this or we're just, you know, thinking about starting it. We need to be showing progress. Uh -huh. um, you know, the preliminary steps would be to get an RFP on the street pretty much immediately as soon as we could, you know, coming back through the process for what the scope of work would be. I think, you know, highlighted the three elements. There's a community engagement, sort of a technical planning and transportation uh, piece, and then an economic piece. Those are the three primary pieces. We would aggressively move forward with a grant application through Silicon Valley Foundation, which their deadline, I think, is the end of, is in July, fairly early July. Um, we had also engaged some conversations with uh, County Health about the healthy community and whether there'd be some opportunity for them to partner and provide some of the, the technical assistance or facilitation of the community process, mm -hmm. uh, embed those into um, the scope. And so those are things, hopefully, would reduce the cost to some degree. And and really, we'd have to be ready in a position where we could start some facilitated community dialogue this fall. And it may not be very good timing with these other programs and activities, but but that's you know a schedule we would have to to embark upon to have any chance of showing demonstrable pro uh, progress by next January. That's I think probably Ray's point of. Um, But if we don't do it, you still got to have the housing element done, right? The zoning. I'm sorry, what was the? 
if we didn't do this precise plan. And when you say precise, uh, how precise are you talking about? Because 200,000 doesn't seem like. Uh, I think it would be, again, the kind of um, design standards um, that would proactively establish a vision for anybody who wanted to do anything on the properties in, in, within the boundaries of that, mm -hmm. that physical area so they would understand, as opposed to them kind of having some box kind of diagrams with, okay, you have minimum setback and this many parking spaces and this much height. You know, the city give them a box and they kind of fill out what the design looks like and get a reaction from the city is, you know, through the precise plan, they would be given some very sp specific design direction as to what the city expects of this project, what it's going to look like. And if they're interested, you know, they know kind of what the city's feeling is about the project and what it needs to be as opposed to putting the city in a reactive place to, to react to some development proposal, which is kind of the more normal process. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, <coughs> you know, when I was on the subcommittee, we've actually talked about this for a few years, and then that's something that ULI also kind of incorporated, and is that part of the stimulus of this, I'm sure, you know, to kind of relook at um, the whole area, you know, um, kind of, redefine our downtown, so to speak, is what it would do, at least the entryway to Brisbane. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm actually okay with everything in the budget, you know, just to preface it, but I, you know, at the same time, I know I want to do some cuts and stuff like that. Uh, of course, I have faith in Stuart that he uh, is really conservative. At least it's proven out in the last four or five years where we've come in under budget the last four or five years, except for two or three years in the middle of the recession. Um, Ray, I certainly see your point, you know, why? Why not to do it? You know, I mean, it's uh, it is a monumental undertaking, but we're also being driven by a timeline too. So, could, could I ask just one staff question about the timeline? Yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah. Maybe going to ask the same one. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> uh, just out of uh, curiosity. Uh, um, if we don't meet the January 31st uh, zoning um, requirement of the of the state, um, and we put it off for a year, let's say, um, I know that one of the consequences might be that, uh, and I guess this is both to John and to Michael, uh, one of the consequences might be that that we wouldn't get eight years of the housing element in place, but only get four. Um, Am I right about that? That's not one. Of, that's not one of the consequences of not meeting the zoning deadline. The, the, the more consequential consequence is the fact that it takes away the uh, the discretion of the council to deny certain types of projects on that particular kind of property. That's really the that's really the hammer that uh, that exists. So would you explain that? I don't have the language right here in front of me, John. Do you have that that language? I don't have the precise language, but as I understand it, that someone would be able to make application through the city on a site that was shown on your housing element for housing, even if it had not been zoned for housing and the city would be obligated to process that application, um, you know, within the very broad parameters of state law, which is the density, and I'm not sure what other kind of, I think the real question is what other kind of um, discretion the city would even have to to modify or, or um, you know, shape that project. I, that's 
probably a legal question. I don't have that right in front of me today. That's, that's the real consequence is that it takes away a great deal of the council's discretion to deny a housing project on that particular property that has been designated for such in your housing element. If I may follow up with the question. Um, so during our housing element meetings, you know, we talked about if you didn't uh, <coughs> fill the time requirement that you'd lose the eight-year cycle and it would be reduced to a, a shorter cycle. So how does that play into this? That played into the date of certification, the certification date. Um, there's also an unknown question of whether the OBAG funding, if you're not demonstrating progress and meeting your state deadlines, I'm not sure that you would retain your OBAG funding eligibility either with a, the although your house, um, one Bay Area grant program, which is discretionary funding through MTC slash ABAG, um, I'm not convinced that if you certify your element but you don't follow through that, that, that you maintain your funding eligibility either. Okay. And, and then um, just one quick question. In regards to uh, design review, so when you take on minimum density in order to achieve your, your low income and uh, moderate low uh, income housing, affordable housing, uh, you give up design review. So, but a precise plan allows you to have that uh, ability to to provide direction. Correct. And still, and still get the um, the benefit of, of uh, reaching your affordable housing unit. That and maintain the city main, maintains control over the sort of the physical form and design of that project without a discretionary design permit. Yes. So then, so if you didn't have a precise plan in place, then a developer could design it any way they wanted as long you know as long as they stayed within the um, uh, the, the minimum density that the, the uh, city uh, puts into that particular site yeah that, that's fundamentally I think the unknown is what level of discretion the city can have if since the, since the state law specifically precludes discretionary design review I, I don't know what guidance the city can impose or regulations the city could impose absent zoning regulations that we theoretically would not have adopted because we haven't moved forward. Okay, thank you, John. I, I, I keep seeing that we being hit with dates that are written in the sand and then they get extended or as long as you're demonstrating that you're working towards this and and I have some major concerns on certainly getting a precise plan for the whole entryway and the housing and you know all the zoning areas that that you're talking about here within the numbers of the of the state and whether we're working towards zoning for the housing or whether we're working on zoning for the entire entryway um, you know we would be showing some sort of measurable success but I don't think that we would get certainly a precise plan implemented with the work we have done um, for the entire area. And I think that we're, we're trying to not just look at housing, which everyone's doing this under the auspice of being forced into housing. And almost no one builds affordable housing. The only way to guarantee or even have a remote success rate of affordable housing is by limiting the size of units. People don't, and to be, you know, and that's something that no one wants to look at, um, saying, oh, you only need 600 or 800 square feet for an apartment or for a home, um, because that's not what developers want to build. And I think that's what we need to do if we want to build housing that is actually affordable. Um, but that's a whole separate issue. I think we need to move forward with um, calling whether we want to include this in the budget. Just John, I had one other question, if I may. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify quickly. You said that it would be one hundred thousand dollars at a minimum, even just to do the housing element, which we'd be required to do. So, 
so Stuart, this may be a question for you then. In the budget, if if we didn't do the specific plan for two hundred thousand, it's really only a hundred dollar difference. You could you would we'd still have to have a hundred thousand um, dollar entry in to satisfy the housing element obligations at a minimum. Right. I mean, whatever the city council chose to put for the housing element would need to still be part of the budget. Okay. John, would a precise plan need to be thoroughly completed in order to submit the number? You're basically submitting a zoning to the state for units per acre or whatever, right? What we would do is integrate the precise plan would, in a sense, serve as the zoning for this area. Mm -hmm. So when you adopted this, the precise plan, if you went with it, um, it would essentially serve the function of that zoning overlay district. That, that's what we're committed to do under the housing element is to establish as, um, affordable housing or a mixed-use overlay zone. Yeah. And this would be a functional equivalent for that. Okay. Yeah. You had a question? <clears throat> I asked it. Okay. Um, I have a, uh, one question, a legal question. If on January 31st we have not completed the precise plan or the zoning that would take its place, does that still have the opportunity that someone could come in and say, you have not zoned by the due date. I want to put in Project XYZ. That potential would be there. That that those provisions of the state law would kick in and the council's discretion would be uh, less than than desirable. Great. Thank you. But, uh, Ms., if I could follow up with a question. So but if we're moving forward, though, with a process. A due diligence. And we, yeah, and we, we've identified these locations. Nice. Um, so, that, I mean, that would be... I would feel like that we'd have something to stand on. That uh, if if we decided that 125 in the village is the area that we are, you know, having the the process to eventually create the precise plan, does that then still by Jan after January 31st, uh, a property owner that's on Park Lane could then submit an application? We would certainly argue that if you were making substantial progress on it that the provisions of the state law ought not to apply because you were sort of moving toward the uh, conclusion of that process. Can't guarantee that that would prevail if you don't actually have that zoning in place by the deadline, but certainly it would strengthen any argument that, uh, that those provisions ought not to apply because the precise plan of the zoning would be forthcoming within a reasonable period of time. Okay. But I don't, it'd be really hard to not accept someone's application if they own the property and came with an application and the zoning wasn't changed. It'd be pretty hard to. Well, we haven't finalized the zoning. But, you no, know, I, know. What you're I understand. Saying, you know, so what you're saying basically is that, okay, well, if we don't do anything, then Park Lane would be zoned and, I, and a de the property owner could develop that site. And if we do something, but we haven't finalized it, the property owner of Park Lane could develop that site. So, I mean, it's... <laughs> okay. All right. So, I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to... Clark, if this is your recommendation to approve this, uh, you know, to budget all these items, I'm fine with doing that as well, though the, the, the one thing is that I have a little uncomfortableness with is the implementation guidelines, and I know uh, probably Kevin Pryor is watching, he's getting all mad at me, and my wife's probably watching, getting mad at me too. I think that if we can't do it through the subcommittee that exists and through looking at previous uh, or looking at other cities, implementation guidelines, if we can't do it in-house on our own, then okay, then let's, let's go have the, the process where we do the, the full-blown community outreach. Um, 
but I, I, I would prefer that, that there be some uh, guidance with that um, money that, that would be earmarked for that. I, I'm sorry, a, Clark, you wanted to approve well, I, all the I, I items said, that I said we... I'm okay with it. You know, I'm okay with, with it, but I think it still warrants discussion because um, I could go either way on it of, of not approving everything, you know, as long as we revisit it in the spring. Um, you know, like the volunteer projects in the city council budget, I, I say we could forego that and as long as we re revisit it, the community chairs in the center park, yes. Uh, and I would include the Mission Blue furniture and also go through this winter. And uh, since it is outside and that hadn't been identified and how we're going to uh, do that, I could forego that as long as we look at it in, this, in uh, February. The lane lines for the pool, we could forego that. And as long as, again, we look at it in spring. Painting of the office, yes. Uh, uh, increase uh, the, the funding for the parks and rec for the day in the park, $10,000. I can forego that. Um, the public arts implementation guidelines, now that was in really part of the sustainability plan of having public arts included. So, I, you know, I, I, I think if we're having the sustainability plan that it's probably important to have this guideline feature. Oh, no, I'm not sure no, no, we, we shouldn't uh, have it. It's yeah. just, you know, how do you uh, go about creating the guidelines? Right? Yeah, I, I mean, so, that's, that's kind yeah. of a, 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 a logistical thing, too. Yeah. So. Clark, we were thinking that there's no big rush on that because I mean, okay. the money is going to come from the Baylands, and then that's going to not happen for a while. Okay. Uh, we might even get them to pay for it. You know, that's kind of what I was thinking. Okay. Not that it, again, isn't a good idea. It's a question of, you know, do we really need to pay for everything? So. Okay. And then uh, the fiber optic consultant, uh, you know, this is something we've been working on for five years. And, yeah. And, you know, kind of honing it down. And it was really kind of looking at if the city went in as a business. And then there was a question. Right. Of can we legally do it? And I think that question has been answered. So the question now is what would the $25,000 provide in moving forward at this point? Because right now we're just like, okay, here's where we're at. Uh, so maybe staff can. Yeah, and Clark, my only thought on that was that uh, this was something that we we're hoping that Mitch will come up with a recommendation about. And I was thinking, you know, let him get his teeth into this. That's one of the things we hope he'll do. Uh, and if he comes out with something that's going to cost such a so-and-so, and so, he can make a recommendation that can be part of the mid-year. That's, that's kind of what I was thinking about. I mean, yeah. I agree with you that it's an important thing to do. Yeah, I still, I still want to hear from what's yeah. But yeah, I just want to let you yeah. know where we were coming from. Sure, so. sure, okay. What, uh, maybe, Michael? The... Well, I think... What Randy and I is, is that on? Yeah, I think oh, okay. what Randy and I have talked about this, um, the concern is that there are some some legal, not the cities can't do that because a number of cities have, but there needs to be uh, a roadmap in terms of what it would actually take to do that, and there are both uh, civil engineers and city and, and attorneys who have done this in the past who can provide that expertise to provide that roadmap. Uh, I don't have that expertise, and, and the firm doesn't really have that expertise, but there are attorneys and, like I said, civil engineers who do have that expertise, and that was, that's what the source of that money was for, was to help us create the roadmap so we can come back with a recommendation to the council as to whether or not it makes sense economically and, and, and other feasible issues. Okay. And, and so you're, you're thinking that maybe let, Mitch... Uh, let Mitch look at it for a while and then talk with Michael and others and then come up with a recommendation. That's, that's what I was thinking. Does that sound reasonable to... I mean, you know, I'm asking... If your <coughs> economic consultant uh, can assist in that endeavor initially uh, to come up with some ideas, I don't think anyone objects to that. Okay, because, I mean, this, one, this is one, you know, I initiated back in... 
was it 2010? <laughs> so it's been well over. Yeah, it's been right. five and a half even, years. Even, <laughs> yeah, long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a long time ago. Yeah, no, I think um, it's important. I mean, that's not the issue. Yeah, no, I, I understand. And, yeah, and I, th I think that sh you indicated that with, with everything on here. Right. It's just that, uh, you know, and, and I certainly understand your concern. So, yeah, I could, uh, I could put that off too, you know. Um, you know, we take a look at these with the exception of the increased funding a day in the park because that will have passed by uh, by the right. time it comes around to February. February is a mid-year, uh, Stuart? Right. <clears throat> that one, January, February? When yeah, uh, usually February is when I can bring it back because I don't get all the information until sometime in January. Okay. So in, in that case, I would say I'm, o I'm okay with the precise plan. I, I think I think it's I think it's worth attempting, you know, at least uh, see how far we get. And then if we have to go back to the state and see where we go with that. Um, delay the volunteer projects in the city council budget, the fiber optics, the public arts implementation. Chairs of the community center, I'd like to add Mission Blue Furniture of $20,000. Uh, lane lines, pools, 2000 7800 for the... Uh, um, Painting an office in the pool. Increase uh, the day in the park, ten thousand dollars. And so, what, what do you think? That would I'm not be quite sure if you're doing negatives or positives on your comments. <laughs> negatives. Okay. They're, they're, okay. The only Except one that I'm agreeing to is you right want now is the precise plan. Is the precise plan. Okay. And the rest we're putting off. Additionally, the Mission Blue furniture. So, I think the total comes to two hundred thousand. Well, Stewart's got a spreadsheet, but <laughs> so, so Clark, not the increase in uh, in the the funding for uh, the community day in the park. Two hundred, yeah. So the bottom one, you're saying don't fund that, or that don't okay? don't fund it. Yeah, I'm saying. Only the precise plan. I'm saying not fund it. The only one to fund is the okay. Southeast Crocker precise plan in the community development. Then take a look at these others in spring, but by that time the, the day in the park had already passed. So the reduction would be 203800 is what I have because I'm adding the $20,000 furniture for Mission Blue to put that off till spring. Take a look at it. Hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred and three thousand. We got two eighty three. And then you're gonna add twenty, and then we're gonna take off two hundred. So. I got two hundred three eight hundred. Can you clarify what you want to do at Mission Blue with the chairs? The furniture at Mission Blue of twenty thousand dollars. There's. To replace it and I'm suggesting that we put that off because right now that's in the Stuart says already. furniture okay. sitting outside and if that's sitting outside and we don't really have a, a place that we're gonna put it you know why buy new furniture if we haven't identified how it's going to be stored <clears throat> wouldn't it be better to put the scaffolding outside than the chairs we could look at that I'm not quite sure that there is as much space for the scaffolding outside but we can we'll figure we can look at how we can best use that space or if we need to look at having additional storage put up there and I think the spreadsheet that Clark is looking at to get to the 200,000 number is the one from the presentation last week which includes the hundred thousand dollar delaying in the positions and that's what the difference is I'm uh, I'm just doing my own math here so Take uh, it be basically uh, two hundred and three thousand eight hundred. Is reduction maybe not? Okay. Yeah. And then no, a hundred thousand. I'm sorry. Mm. You want to put it on the, on the spreadsheet? Mm. I think you're just it, adding two hundred thousand back into. 
the budget subcommittee's recommended recommendation. Yeah. yeah, you're adding the precise. Point. Yeah, basically, and it comes <clears throat> to 203, 800, right? 283 to 83, and then you're going to add uh, Mission Blue. No, he's not. No, I am at adding Mission Blue. Well, but you're not at you're you're not suggesting. I'm subtracting it out. <laughs> I'm suggesting that we don't purchase the furniture. He's adding so the line. You put he's another line of twenty thousand dollars to add that to it. No, I, I understand that, but you, yeah. you're, you're also saying you don't want to fund it right now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not so so I think that the other items that we still need further discussion on before we you know fight make any final decisions are the public facilities condition assessment for 50,000 the bike trail and pedestrian master plan for 50,000 and then the 225,000 on the stairway okay Can we, I, I still wanted to have some additional discussion on these ideas because all, all I've talked all some of us have talked about is the precise plan and you know, okay Clark talked about all of them, but I want okay. to um, say I'm okay with them with what Clark said, with the exception of I wanted to get some clarification on the um, public arts implementation guidelines. Um, so, if we don't fund it, does that mean what, what, what we had just stand still in the process? Is there anything that can go forward at the staff level without funding of a speaker series? Uh, um, you know, I've, I've talked, I've emailed with the committee that's working on it, and they would develop a plan um, sometime in July, depending on which way the city council goes. So I'm sure they will continue to work on something. They may come, you know, they may <coughs> come back to the city council, I think as Clark said, after the mid-year, after they've gotten a certain point and, fig and find they can't go any further without having a more of a public process. You know, I, I think this is the same conversation about a lot of the things that we do is that this is a, you know, this is going to be something that's going to be out in public. And there would, you know, and I think the subcommittee that's looking at it is really looking at trying to create some kind of a public process that brings in the, you know, brings in developers or landowners, brings in the arts community, you know, just tries to really reach out. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, but they will come up with a plan to figure out what to do without any money. Okay, and um, in the interim, if there are any development projects uh, that get approved, like what happened at Sierra Point, you know, we just have to be mindful then that, um, like what happened at the at, at the five thousand seven thousand Marina, um, that developer then is going before, for in this instance, the Economic Development Subcommittee, and you know, coming up with an idea for vetting um, by, well, it's not just economic development, actually, it was, um, it was a, it wasn't, sorry, it wasn't economic development, it was a, no, like an ad hoc, the art, uh, or the, uh, we had the parks and rec, arts. it was the public arts subcommittee, subcommittee right, some of the same people. <laughs> yeah. um, so there will be, some, there may be an ad hoc process that, you know, needs to happen in the interim on any interim projects. So, you know, it's, it's not like this precise plan where something can happen without us, you know, knowing about it or, or having the ability to approve it. But, you know, we, it's something that I think we need to, we might not be able to do it in this budget cycle or at least in this half a year, first half of the year. But um, I, I think that, you know, when when the time comes and when, there, when we feel more comfortable to put it in the budget, I, you know, I, I'd like to see us move forward with the process because, you know, we will need a robust public participation to develop the guidelines and we passed the ordinance so you know we don't want to let it just sit there for too long and just keep the ball rolling it's 20,000 for the mission blue furniture Yeah, I do have a question for you, Stuart, since you're the, the Park and Rec guy. So the, the Park and Rec Commission wanted to add the $10,000 into the, uh, you know, for the, to get more, um, just to enliven the community in the park, get, you know, they were thinking of doing the zip line. And right, I mean, I think, you know, what they're looking at is that, you know, this, the community, 
you know, for what, what we get for $20,000 is we get, you know, two or three activities for the children. We have, um, you know, like the small little carnival games. We do the day in the park, or we do the derby race. You know, we also have the vendors. We have one band or two bands. And I think what they're looking at is if they can get an additional 10,000, there can be two or three more activities that, you know, larger activities that they can do, such as a zip line. I don't know what the other ones exactly are that they're looking at, but they could bring in a band or a better band to try and bring more of the community. Um, and I, you know, and I think there's always conversation is, you know, do, you know, do we want to, you know, do a little bit more advertising to try and attract more people to, you know, to help the, the nonprofits that are there, to help the, um, the artist vendors who are there. So, I mean, all those kinds of things can be done with additional money. It's just a matter of, you know, is that, the, is that a policy decision that the council wants to make? Or is the council happy with, you know, the kinds of programs that we've put forward in the past? Mm -hmm. I, I'd, I'd like to see the additional money in there. I, I think we could uh, use a little spicing up of the community day in the park. I think it's been kind of the same old, same old. So. Making it different doesn't mean necessarily spending more money. No, you got a point. You got a point. You need to be more creative with the money that you have. And then I thought we also made it where we had businesses come into the community park um, last year that didn't come to the council. It was a decision that the Parks and Rec made towards the end of the registration process. And doesn't that bring in funding? Um, you know, we charged them the same that we charged other vendors to be there. We did not charge a premium for businesses to be there. So, I mean, we charged them about the same that we would charge a artist to be there. How about a sponsorship program like the, um, we have the... Um, concerts in the park? Yeah, concerts in the park. Yeah, we can attempt to do that. Yeah. Well, they wouldn't need to have a sponsor if they can be there for... Fifty dollars. They wouldn't need to sponsor it because they're there anyway with their presence. Right. I mean, if the city council wants us to look at increasing what we charge to the vendors, we can look at that. No, I, I, I just think that you know, spending another ten thousand dollars for one day, which, you know, is is a lot of money. So, okay. I have a question about that. So last year we had the walk on water. Is that something that's included in the plans for this year's? Day in the park? Or was uh, it not yeah, that? I mean, or was at the moment. The, no, I'm thinking of the oh. um, farmer's markets. Perhaps. That was at the farmer's market. Okay. Cause, so it's for the zip line? I mean, part of it would be the zip line, and part of it would be for other types of, act, you know, other, uh, probably another activity of that quality. I mean, the zip line is a $3,500 to $4,000 expense if we were okay. to set that up. And what kind of liability it is for Michael um, would the city be taking on with a zip line? I mean, you may know, like in the news, there was a horrible accident that happened at some summer camp earlier this week, and some, I think, 12 year old died from a zip line accident. Um, I was curious to know what you know, that's. Well, typically, if, you, if the contracting organization is going to provide the zip line, you're going to require indemnification from them with insurance. If the city itself is is putting it on, then, you know, then the city has that, that risk. Um, certainly, you know, we presumably it would be covered by <coughs> our, uh, risk sharing. <coughs> so our exposure technically would only be $25,000, assuming that that risk is covered by the, by the pool. And what age group would it um, be used by? Until they decide what type of a zip line and the height and everything, I don't know if we know that for sure. Okay. I mean, it, it would be working with the company that provides it to ensure, you know, because they are the ones who are going to have, pri you know, primary liability insurance for this. That they, you know, they're the ones who are going to have to make sure that it's safe for them, for them to do and for the age groups that they would have it for. Okay. Well, I'm okay. Um, with not funding that for this year. I, I, I personally feel like the day in the park is a fun event as is. There's always a lot of people who show up and having an activity like a zip line makes me a little nervous. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I don't know if that's the type of activity that I, that I would want to support. Um, 
I, maybe other activities and maybe less expensive ones, but I'm, I'm comfortable with holding off for this year on anything further. And then we have the public, the additional items for additional discussion, which were the items that the subcommittee could not come to an agreement on. And um, I think both of the, the, the two $50,000 consultant fees, in my opinion, was something that we could put off. I think that, again, it's uh, trying to bite off a lot of planning and, and I, I really felt that the bike trail and pedestrian master plan should be looked at by the complete streets and park and rack before it goes to a, to a um, consultant if needed. And that while it's always good to know what your public, you know, your costs are going to be on your public facilities, it doesn't give you any money to do any of those things. It's a planning tool. But that's only if you have money to put towards those items to begin with. Um, so that's why I recommended those two items to not be, to be brought back for further discussion. Um, and then uh, the Alvarado and Tulare Stairway, it is a fairly large expenditure and it's not one of my pet projects. Um, not that any of these truly are, but I wanted we wanted to bring it back to see what the council's opinion was on those items. Well, what was your uh, opinion, Ray? Uh, well, I'll give you what it was at the time and what it is now, which of course has changed. Um, the public facilities condition assessment, um, I was, I'm still in favor of that. Um, I think we really knew do need to get a thorough investigation of the condition of all of our facilities and uh, we need to start a you know, maintenance program and I think we need to take care of our capital infrastructure and that would be a part of it. So I was actually in favor of that one. Um, the bike trail and pedestrian, I thought, well, you know, I mean, I, I like doing that. I think it's a good idea, but I was trying to think maybe there might be other funding sources and I was thinking of the bakery money. I know not everybody would be delighted with that, but there is that fund there. Yeah. Uh, and so that crossed my mind. Uh, and then on the um, Alvarado to Tulare Stairway, uh, you know, I'm really in favor of that. I mean, we've been, again, talking about something we've been discussing for years. I mean, that started in the 70s and I'd like to see that done. But on the other hand, if I'm consistent with my you know, deficit hawk position, uh, I, I have to say that I'd be willing to, you know, let that one go if that's the w pleasure of the rest of the council. My turn, I guess. Um, out of these three, the one that I would like to see the most, but I would be okay deferring it another six months would be the bike trail and pedestrian master plan. I think that would help improve the connectivity in Crocker Park um, and in, the, in, in central Brisbane as well. Um, the public facilities condition assessment, I, I haven't heard that there's any particular public facilities that are in, in dire need of this, so unless there's any information that staff has, then I would be okay with deferring that. And the stairway is the most, is the most expensive of these three, so given the deficit in the budget, I would defer that as well. So you'd want to include a consultant for the bike trail and pedestrian rather than have it looked at by committee? Is that a yes. Point? Okay, so right now, um, well, 
I'll keep my own tally. Yeah. Clark? Um, I agree with Ray on the public facilities assessment um, because when we've talked about this, you know, uh, actually subcommittee has, and uh, it's something, yeah, it's a big chunk of money, but it's like the water and sewer master plan. It's like be like the bike and trail pedestrian plan. You got to plan for these things, and and we've never really done a facility assessment. And I think it's consistent, you know, about how we come up with an assessment in order for us to plan our capital properly. And I think it goes into our five-year plan from a budget standpoint on how we're going to distribute capital. So. I do think that's important. Um, I like your idea of going to the uh, park and rec complete streets of, of looking at the first cut on the master plan, but I'm not sure logistically how that would work. I think Randy can best speak to that. Is, is that microphone on? Oh. We never can hear him very well. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Oh. Uh, Randy can speak to it. He has already talked to you before about it. Remind you of what we have already talked about. Yeah. Okay. So, so I just, it would be my opinion, sir, that the combination of the Complete Streets Committee and staff would not have enough resources to complete that effort. Right. On um, how about Ray's suggestion of using the shang money? I, I don't have an engineering opinion on that. <laughs> so, I guess I'm looking at you, but I'm smart man. Looking at you. That's sure. staff jujitsu, sir. I just kind of moved out of the way. Well, I'll, I'll take a step. I mean, that, that's clearly your decision. Is, is that, well, let me ask you this. Where, where did those funds lie, or where are they laying at? Those are in a separate fund. Separate? Bakery fund. They're not general they're, fund. they're not part of the general fund at all. There's a separate fund for that for that dollar amount. So it would not have any, if you take it out of that fund, it would have no impact on the general fund. And I think that's appropriate. I think that's probably a good use. And I think, Cliff, that was your suggestion. Way in the beginning. Right. Yeah, way in the beginning. Yeah. How much is in that fund? 50,000. 300. Oh, 300. Oh, 300. Oh, 300. Yeah. yeah. Something like around 300. Yeah, right. So from that aspect, then I, I would be okay with that. Um, I would, I would think that um, building a stairway, which is, you know, public access would be more in theory or in um, to use those funds, but uh, well, there's still funds there. But I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I mean, it, it. We talked about I know a couple of years ago when we were going through this process with Shanki about what to use it for, and I think we kind of had uh, some kind of general consensus of putting it towards trails right you know and um, yeah that's the one element in the language here it says bike and pedestrian and trails it should also say yeah right it says, it says bike trail and pedestrian master plan and right. so kind of would uh, fall in that category you know and the Alvarado to Tulare stairway I know we've talked about this um, Randy, is this amount for planning, designing, and building? It, it's for the design and construction, sir. It's for designing? Yes, sir. We've already got a preliminary design done. Oh, you do? Yes, sir. So it's for building it? Yes, sir. Okay. That's something we could probably really put off on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that's a big chunk. I know. Uh, this is the one. Uh, this is the one with the wall that a Andy Torvik always talks about. And <laughs> yes, this is the one that goes past two seventeen Alvarado. Yes, yeah. sir. So we do have a design in place, and um, you know, something to look at in springtime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, because really, uh, well, we are coming up in the summer month, but you know. Always better if you prove something that it starts at the beginning of the end of the rainy season, which I guess we are at right now. But yeah, I can I could forego that one too. 
So, um, do we want to, um, does staff have a, a general theory of where we're standing with the <coughs> possible appropriations that we've made? So, what my understanding is that the base budget would be what was presented to you minus the volunteer projects, minus the fiber optic consultant, minus the public arts implementation guidelines, minus the Mission Blue Furniture, minus the lane lines, uh, sorry, minus the community center furniture, minus the lane lines, minus the painting of the office, minus the $10,000 increase for the day in the park, um, minus the bike trail master plan and to keep the Alvarado Tulare unfunded and then I would bring back a supplement, I would also take out the Southeast Crocker precise plan and have that be a supplemental appropriation available for you to make that on the 18th. So that way you can have consensus on the budget, you know, on a base budget and then if you would like to add back the precise plan into it. That was my that was my understanding. Uh, or you add the precise plan. So, well, my understanding is you don't have a full consensus on the Southeast Crocker precise plan. So one way to do this would be to put to have a budget that you do receive a 5-0 vote for, and then you take a vote separately on the Southeast precise plan. Mm -hmm. And that way, if you if that passes, that would be added back to the budget that day. But you know, it would be added back. And potentially not a 5 0 vote. Okay, so this would be on our June 18th meeting. Right, so you would have two, two separate resolutions. Okay. One for the base budget and one for the Southeast Precise Plan. Okay, and then the, the, the master bike, trail, and pedestrian plan that we would have also a vote to put that, to take that money out of the. I, I would actually have that as part of, the, uh, part of the Exhibit A for the base budget because I think I heard. A consensus on that to take it out of the Shanky? Yes. Or did I not? Yes. No, I did, did not. not. Okay. So that would be it. So that would be a separate resolution as well. Yeah, separate. That's a separate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 But so I'd have two separate resolutions: one for the southeast, and one for the bike. Okay. Mass, All right. Bike right. trail master plan. And then the public facilities conditions assessment. Do you, do that supplemental? do you want me to do that as a supplemental as well? Well, I don't know. I, uh, I haven't. I, I can. I can agree to. I mean, if. If it's consensus to leave the public facilities condition assessment in the budget, I <coughs> can negotiate that. You can go with that. I can go for that. Okay, so it would just be Laurie. What does that take us to? What's the bottom line deficit? <sighs> Including the precise plan. You would have a def. I mean, it would be a projected deficit, assuming the precise plan passes. I think you, you didn't take out the public facilities, uh, right? Well, the, the, that one would come out. Okay. Yeah, out of the general fund. But so if the okay, so if the <laughs> precise plan passed, and if the okay. bike trail master bike trail pedestrian master plan passed. It would be a deficit of one million two hundred forty-nine thousand. Mm. Wait a minute. You got a net. <laughs> it's not. I'm, I'm not following it here. I mean, if we kept the public facilities condition assessment in. Yes. I mean, right now. Uh, it's out, right? Well. It was in. And the negative oh. one twenty-five. I mean, we kept it in. These others are out. But, so, I mean, oh. you charge backwards. If you keep it in, you're right. Yeah. It would be 1 .3 mil about $1.3 million. But the negative 125? Right. Well, that was not in the budget to begin with, and what I heard was to keep it out of the budget. That's so right. that's why I was reading the $1,299,200. Well, I My math's not working. 
Okay, so let me go over, let me go over it again. We would so in the base budget, you would have you we, exhibit A would show a reduction of ten thousand dollars for the volunteer project. It would show a reduction of two hundred thousand for the Southeast Crocker Precise Plan, but I the question is if it passes, which it seems as if it would at the moment, is that that would not really be a real reduction because it would get, it would get approved. Yes. The fiber optic consultant in Public Works. Would be re, would be taken out, and that gets you to the 1360, 1368. Public arts guidelines gets you to 1348. The Mission Blue furniture gets you to 1328. The chairs at the community center gets you to 1319. Lane lines gets you to 1317. Painting at the pool would get you to 1309, and then the increase in the day in the park funding would get you to 129. But the trip, this one does come out. Right. And so, the, if the public facilities condition gets gets approved, it'd be at one million two ninety nine, and then the bike trail comes out because it's going to be part of the Sheng Key. Yes. And I know we'll bring that back as a separate resolution as well. To do that. So <laughs> basically, we you'd have a deficit of one million two hundred and. Fifty thousand plus two hundred thousand, perhaps. Well, that's already well. That two hundred thousand is already assumed assumed to be in there because I took that as a zero. There'll be a separate vote on it. But There'll be a separate vote on it. The bottom line you got here includes it. Includes it because you're you're reading the votes. Um, at the moment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Doesn't mean it won't change. Okay. The two hundred thousand is already in the budget. It was, it's already. Well, it's, it's going to come. It's going on Exhibit A. It will come out of the base budget, yes. and so it will be a separate about, vote. So yeah. it comes out to about two hundred fifty thousand less than the original budget deficit, which was one point five. Correct. Okay. So we are saving two hundred fifty thousand. Well, a hundred and fifty thousand because one hundred was right. in in just delayed hiring, not in. That was going to happen probably naturally. That was yeah that. And we're still not including the city entryway, the um, ornamental turf, the Lippman bathrooms, the quarry road, the dog park lighting, none of that. And we're still going to have a bigger deficit than either one of us. Well, what about taking out the public facilities condition assessment and reassessing that in six months? I'm fine either way, but that would be. But based on the five-year projections, you know, then we'll we'll be in the block. And as Clark had said, Stuart always uh, low balls anyways. Can't in pass. in the block, other than the seventeen million dollars of unfunded liabilities, seventeen million dollars, people. Yeah. Well. You know, they, uh, you know this. Is, well, okay, we're done. Yeah. All right. All right. I think I think we're good. So, do we need to vote on this, or do we just no, need to give direction to staff? Night, right. Uh, formally. Right. Unless you have anything else you want to add to this list, I, I have the direction, and I will be coming back with a budget with an Exhibit A, which removes items, and then I'll be coming back with um, supplemental appropriation resolutions. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'll see you tomorrow.